to boldly go where no man has gone before. <laughs> hey everybody! Hey everybody! It's uh, episode twenty of the third season, the final season of the original live-action, as, as we'll call it, Star Trek. Last time, we had Methuselah, who was played by that guy. You've told me already. I know you've. Co I know it's, it's. For me, it hasn't happened yet, but I know in my soul I know it. You've told me it's that guy from. The a, a stop at Willoughby episode of the Twilight Zone. I know, I know. He really is that old. He he's so old. He actually, in his original timeline, he went back in time to Willoughby, to spend even more time. No wonder he has time to build all this fancy stuff on that planet. He just goes back in time every now and again. You know, the first thing he did was build a railway, and uh, he just he just cycles back in time. At least developed enough technology to miniaturize the. It's a bit like Cat's Ball, wasn't it? Miniaturize the Enterprise. You know, they had the same thing in Cat's Ball. They made a tiny. Although no, it was tinier in Cat's Ball. I think they they heated it up over a candle. I think um, in Cat's Ball. And uh, in the last one, Kirk just looked in the view screen to see what was up. Nothing. They're all, they're all wink of an eye. So it's safe to say that there was a combination of ideas going on there. How can we combine wink of an eye and cat's paw? Well, and uh, what are little girls made of? Well, that's how. And I don't want to think about that episode. I'm still that Kirk, Kirk in that episode is still annoying me. So. We'll move on from that. Spock was great in that episode, by the way. Sometimes I think Leonard Nimoy is the only one <laughs> who cares <laughs> about his own character. We did have that one episode where he was cranky. I'll give him one episode. Both Kirk and McCoy have acted all sorts of crazy sometimes. And I just can't understand it. I guess Spock isn't. Uh, he has sort of an easier time of it because his his general nature is to be calm and kind of stoic. You know, he's not going to have any crazy lines like "You love me, not him." <laughs> this is the way to Eden. Well, I know the way to San Jose, but Eden entirely different thing altogether. Let's find the way to Eden. And uh, have a fun time getting there. Could be a woman's name. Oh, what the hell is this? What is that? A tiny ship? Never seen anything like it. What is it, fellas? We're chasing it. There's definitely the stolen space cruiser, Captain. Space cruiser. Six aboard. Hailing frequencies. They're going to Eden. Don't distract them. Oh, this is the Enterprise. Where's Uhura? They are receiving us, Captain. You're not there Uhura. No evidence of malfunction. They're turning. Here we go, sir. Oh, that's quick. Jason, Sulu. Pursue and overtake. Aye, aye, sir. Well, what if they warp into us? Continues on course. It will enter Romulan space. Engage. Oh. Tract beam engaged. Bring them in. Is Eden in Rom Romulan space? Their engines are seriously overheating, Captain. They could explode. Power approaching critical. Uh oh. Beam them out of there. Scotty, are you ready to transport? Aye, Captain. Get him. Explosion is imminent. Scotty! Aurora personnel, stand by to be transported aboard. Is she going to be vital to the episode? Stand in Aurora? Energize. Scotty! Are they aboard? Give him a... he's doing it. Give him a chance. Hi, Captain. Oh, hello. They are. And a nice I'm one. I was already doing it. Wasn't I? That one looks like me. The one in the back. With the crazy hair. Space. Are these the space hippies? I know there's space hippies coming. These could be the space hippies that I've heard about. Edges of the 
I mean, there's only five episodes left. There's gotta be one of them. Shouldn't some of them be like posed like they're at the controls of their ship? Instead of all standing up. I guess Kirk told them to, to prepare to be beamed. They just want to find their... They're on a holy quest to find Eden. It's in Romulan space, but the Romulans won't mind. It's only six people, you know? We were shown the way in a vision. Our, our leader showed us. I'm making up a story. It's a pilgrimage. I don't know. The son of the Catulan ambassador is one of six we have beamed aboard. We have been ordered to handle him with extreme delicacy because the treaty negotiations are in a crucial phase. They're funny looking. Take them to the briefing room. We are not in the mood, Herbert. Oh. Irina? No, Herbert, it's no go. Check off. Shall I send for security? No, I'll be right down. That's far. No, go, no, go. No, go. No, go. No, go. Which go, one of you go, is Tonga go. Rat? Oh, you? You can thank your father's influence for the fact that you're not under arrest. If you have an explanation, I am prepared to hear it. Tell, tell us. What's up? No? Silent treatment? But you were just yelling a second ago. There are going to be troubles, Spark. Do you want this episode off? Spark, take them to sick bay for a medical check. But they don't want to go anywhere. That guy's got such... You see the ears on that guy? He's like a Ferengi. Oh! One. We are one. Are you one, Herbert? I'm one. I am not Herbert. He's not Herbert. We reach. And your objective. Are you Herbert? We turn our backs on confusion and seek the beginning. What is your destination? Eden. Eden. Planet Eden. That planet it is a myth. We recognize no authority save that within ourselves. Well, whether you recognize authority or not, I am it on the ship. Because of my orders, you are not prisoners, but my guests. I expect you to behave as such. Oh, Herbert, you are stiff. Is it like be being a square? We respectfully request that you take us to Eden. Quick question. Do they have any supernatural powers? I know they're all from different planets, apparently. Do you, any of you have the power to take over this vessel? I, I'd like you to fill out this questionnaire form. We've had troubles with strange people before, so just tick the, any box that applies. Do your eyes go up in the back of your head? You know? Do you have any ESP of any kind? Have any of you seen any lights recently? Mm -hmm. Does this mean anything to you? You know, if, if they're just, if they just, if they have no powers except for being obnoxious, then this is going to be easy peasy. We just put them somewhere and we ignore them and we get out of it. What do you think, Herbert? This guy's such a Herbert, isn't he? Freaking Captain Herbert. One of the guys has like a little infinity symbol on his egg. And one of the one in the back reminds me of somebody. I don't know who. The, the the main one in the middle reminds me of somebody too, but I don't know. I don't know. None of the others do. Just the the main guy, the one in the back. And I think one of them is the first person with the co the colored hair. Is the, uh, the the somebody important that we're supposed to treat well or something? I I will double check that. Right, the son of a Catalan ambassador. So, uh, be careful. Oh, <laughs> the transcript refers to them as hippies. That's funny. These are the these are the hippies. Okay. I mean, so far, all I've heard is that they want to go to Eden. That's fine by me. No problems there. You know, if they had their own transportation and they weren't going into Romulan space, then that would be fine with me, but... I have orders to the contrary. Herbert! 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 That's a bit annoying. Lieutenant Palmer, notify Starbase. We have the six aboard. Personal note that the Cullen ambassador, his son is safe. Captain. Yeah. Do you know one of Sir, them? I believe I know one of Did them. Did you date one of them? 
Irina Galilian. Maybe you can get through to her. We were in Starfleet Academy together. One of those was in the Academy. Yes, sir. You wish to see her? Permission to leave your post. Thank you, sir. Kirk's all judgy. One of those was in Starfleet? Do they really believe that Eden exists? Many myths are based on truth, Captain. Yeah. And they are not unintelligent. Their leader, Dr. Severin, is a man... Dr. Severin is their leader. A doctor. Yes. In the fields of acoustics, communications, and electronics on Tiburon. No, cool. They've rejected all that. And yeah. they seek the primitive. What makes you so sympathetic with them? It is not uh, the sympathy so much as curiosity. They regard themselves as aliens in their own world. Yeah. A condition with which I am somewhat familiar. Hey, good point. Maybe we should check out wherever they're well, going to. What does Herbert mean? It is... Um, Uncomplimentary, yeah. Captain. It's like being a square. Rigid and limited patterns of thought. Yeah. He's been called worse. Well, try to be less rigid in my thinking. Captain Dunsell, remember? Oh, they they have instruments. Where do they get those? For the good land. Don't cry. Don't cry. Don't cry. Ah, now they, they feel more like hippies now. Somebody gave them these instruments, by the way. In sick day. <laughs> hey! Excuse me, is uh, Irina Galiulin with you? Yeah, she's just over she's there. She's getting her physical. Okay. Gonna crack my knuckles and jump for joy. I got a clean bill of health from Dr. McCoy. Nice, <laughs> nice. Say, tell me, why do you wear all those clothes? How do you breathe? Irina. Pavel Andreevich. You know I was on the Enterprise? She's very pretty. I had heard. Why? Hey, this is a private moment? Come. Are they in a, a threesome relationship with those three? How could you do this to yourself? You were a scientist. Look at you. Look at yourself, Pavel. Yeah. How can you breathe in that? Why did you do it? Why did you? Everybody's looking. I believe in what I do. Can you say that? Yes. Oh, we should not tear at each other so, Pavel. Today, when I first knew it was your ship that followed us, I thought of you and wondered what I would find. Yeah. Yeah. I got a question. Uh, it's not about hippies, but it is about this situation. If we take away, if they just had their own ship, so we, we, we remove the they've stolen a ship from the whole equation, would the attitudes towards them be the same? I think the attitudes towards them would be the same. I think everybody would feel exactly the same way towards them that they've been showing. Spock is the only one who's even, you know, remotely sympathetic towards them. They've given up these, they're very smart, they're bright, they went to college, they went to the academy, they've studied deep into their fields of interest, and then they've given it all up to pursue this quest for this planet, this Eden, that they believe exists. And I say, okay. You know? Take away the fact that they stole the, the vehicle to get there. And I say, fair enough. They want to do that. That's their right. If they're not hurting anybody, absolutely. But there seems to be the attitude of they're wasting their their gifts, their talents, they're throwing away solid careers, they're, they're wasting their lives doing something that we don't believe in. Therefore, we should look down at them and we should make fun of them. Now, it doesn't, it doesn't help with the, the singing and the, the Herbert stuff. That doesn't help their case. But on principle, I have no problem with these people. Hey, Chekhov. Hey, Chekhov. You still love her? He's trying not, not to look at her. He knows if he looks at her, he'll he'll fall right under her gaze. Look at look at the way she's looking at him. You know? If the robot lady if the robot lady was looking at Kirk like this in the last episode, then I could understand. But uh, she wasn't. Personality of a lemon. A lemon. That last episode. <laughs> I know she was a robot. <laughs> <laughs> 
Anyway, if they cut out the, their annoying behavior, maybe, I don't know, maybe it needs to be annoying for us to, to have that contrast in this episode. They seem to reject, maybe it's not just about finding Eden, like the actual biblical place, the paradise. Maybe it's not just about that. Maybe it's like Kirk was saying, and Spock did that conversation, that they're rejecting the, the, the current structure of society. They're stepping outside of that because they feel restricted by it. They feel maybe that their whole lives are... I, you know, I understand this in, in some, some aspects. A bit like Spock understands it. He feels a little alien in his surroundings. I, I, I understand that too. So maybe that's why he and I are more sympathetic. I know they're going to be annoying. I know that they're, that they're acting super annoying. I know that, but I understand. What do you think, Chekhov? You've been standing there a long time, not saying anything. What's your deal? <laughs> Gotta look at her sooner or later. By the way, we have one true love for Kirk, that one he married. No, well, you could argue the last one, the one he, he Spock had to make him forget. But the one he married, we'll, we'll say that's the one for him. We have one for McCoy, that's uh, the one on the asteroid that's heading course corrected to a planet. We've got uh, one for Scotty in the lights of Zatar, that one. Maybe this one. And then maybe this one, Chekhov. Maybe you could go with her to Eden. The one that got away. You know? Chekhov's had plenty of action over the seasons. You know? So maybe maybe she could maybe she's the one though. He did seem affected when he heard her. He instantly recognized her voice too. And Spock Spock and that Romulan. In spite of that uniform. I still see the same Pavel I used to know. Stop staring. This ain't no circus show, fella. Are you happy in what you do? Yes. Then I accept what you do. He's highly respected. You even talk like them. Like what? What do you mean by that? You never felt as I did. I did? You don't have it in you to feel so much. Mm. You were off thinking of something else. Maybe. And why did you stay away? Because you disapproved of me, just as you do now. You do disapprove of her now. Oh, Pavel, you have always been like this. So correct. Give in to yourself. You will be happier. I'm not sure about that. Go to your friends. Oh, one thing I will add. I am completely... There is a parallel probably here, more, more than likely, to hippies in real life in America at this time that I will completely not understand or get or so the social commentary as as regards to that uh, I will be pretty much ignoring because I don't have the experience and the, the knowledge to talk about it I just, just be aware that I know it, obviously I know it exists I just don't know how to speak about it and maybe, like, my guess is that hippies of back then, the late 60s, were seen as uh, sort of uh, lazy or disruptive or, you know, just just get a job, you damn hippie. You know, that sort of thing. That's That's the only image, you know, that I would have of that. Like, peace, love, and harmony from the hippie side. And the uh, the other side would be more kind of get join us in the real world, yes, damn Tibby. yeah. So, but I'll be talking just mostly. I'll I'll be focused on just what's happening in this episode and nothing else. So far, it's fine, by the way. Apart from a, a little bit annoying, it's it's fine so far. But we saw what happened last time, and I like this checkoff stuff. What's going on, Bob? Is he dying? Trouble. Friend here didn't want to check up. Turns out there's a reason. 
I don't know what this man was planning on doing on a primitive planet. I can tell you what would have happened had he settled it. Untrue? Since the Caucasus Novi is deadly. Okay. Does he have it? What about the others? Well, the others are clear. He doesn't have it. He's a carrier. Remember your ancient history, typhoid and Mary? But he carries the disease and spreads it to others. Oh, okay. Is the crew in danger? Oh, no. Why did you bring me in here, Dodes? In the meantime, he should be placed in total isolation. Yeah, quarantine for you, this dude. Is outrageous. You're not isolating me, you're imprisoning you're me. You're carrying a thing, dude. Put him in isolation. The captain believes he's doctor. He, there's no... You can't do anything. Unless your ears have superpowers. I want a guard maintained on Dr. Severin until further notice. More than one. You don't belong with them. You know what we want. You want it too. Come, join us. Oh, geez. Sulu's already joined them. We know what he's like. <laughs> At least season one Sulu would all have already joined them. He'd be sitting down. He'd be singing songs. He'd have a flower in his hair already. That's the Sulu I know. <laughs> How do you know what I want? You're young. Think young, brother. Yeah, think young. You make it tempting. Mr. Sulu. It's not bad of it, Sulu. Mr. Sulu, explain. Ah, just talking to him. No explanation, sir. Dr. Severin will be released when we think he is medically safe. Stiff man putting my mind in jail <laughs> And the judge bang the gavel and say no bail He's pretty good at improvisation, isn't he? Hey, Hadley. Engineering to bridge. Did you meet the hippies yet, Hadley? Yeah. Mr. Spark, I don't seem to be able to communicate with these people. Do you think you can persuade them? I shall make an attempt, Captain. Thank you, Mr. Spark. I have no influence over what they do. They will listen to your reasoning. Yeah, you're the leader. I can use the resources of the Enterprise to determine whether or not Eden actually exists. Yeah, yeah, we can research it. Plot its exact location. Yeah. I can present a case to Federation to allow you and your group to colonize that planet. Neither you nor your people hey, are at present charged with a crime. If they persist, they will be so charged and forever barred from Eden. As I have been barred? Then you knew you were a carrier. Of course I knew! What I fail to understand is why you disobey those orders. Because this is poison to me! This stuff you breathe, this stuff you live in. Programs in those computers that run your ship and your lives for you. They bred what my body carries. That's what your science have done to me. Right. Hey, maybe there's a cure on Eden for him. Like like the doc had a cure on the asteroid. Only their way of living is right. Your very presence will destroy the people you seek. I shall go to them and be one with them. And together we shall build a world such as this galaxy has never seen. A life. They could be like the Organians. And now you're going to try to persuade me that your technologies will find a cure for me and then I'll be free to go. I don't think, yes, Doctor. I don't think that's true. All right, you send them in. I'll talk to them. No, I don't trust that. You should be here too, Spock. At the same time. I do not trust... I don't trust that he'll, he'll do what he says. Look at the smile. Dr. Severin is insane. Mm -hmm. I've not consulted Dr. McCoy, but I have no doubt of it. He didn't seem insane. He seemed frustrated. He seemed bitter. He seemed angry. He seemed determined. Uh, maybe a little egomaniacal. A little bit. Maybe a little, a little arrogant. Just as we are. Uh, I, I don't know. I'd have to read, listen to the whole conversation. Maybe there were aspects of insanity there. You know, endangering the very people he he's professing to want to live with and start an Eden with. But yeah, Spock says it, it, it's usually 100% true. But uh, good, good performance. The actor is great. I, I do like how he's acting that part. So, top marks for that. Spock, I'm sorry you had great respect for him. His condition does not affect my interest in the movement. There is no insanity in what they seek. Do you want to research it, Spock, on your own? I made a promise, which I should like to keep. Right. I must locate Eden. He's promised Mr. Spock that he will order his disciples to conform to our rules and regulations. Yeah, we didn't we didn't watch that happen, but Hey fella. I'm crossing you? No. Spock has instruments. I was too. just thinking, I Hey, brother, do you play? Yeah, he does. He does. Can I try it? Absolutely. 
This guy's the coolest one. Ooh. Oh, ho, that's now! Groovy. I reach that, brother. I really do. Give us something, Spock. No, not the dregs one. Ooh, talent. Yeah. I want to play it now. Hey, how about a session? You and us, it would sound... If I understand you correctly, I believe the answer might be yes. Yeah! I'll spread the word. You're making friends, Spock. Whoop! Speaking of making friends. You can take a break, can't you, Chekhov? I have been looking for you, Pavel. Just 20 minutes, Chekhov. What room is this? Auxiliary control. Should the main control room break down, we can navigate the ship from here. No, Chekhov, she's gonna... She's figuring out how things work. She's gonna take over the ship. What do you want? To take over the ship, probably. To apologize. Does not matter. Oh, but it does. It is against everything I believe in. And I do not like having you angry with me. Or disapproving. And why do you do such things? Like what? What specifically? What are you working on? I am assisting Mr. Spock. Locating your... Eden. Eden. We project the orbits of the various planets here. Do you know all these things? What I do not know, I find out from the computer banks. If I knew nothing at all, I could navigate the ship simply by studying what is stored in there. Yeah. You've told her everything. She's bewitched hey. you. Oh, you know He's looking at her now. He's, hey. he's done for. You always had to be different. Not different. What I wanted to be. Fade to black. Ah, crap. I am not receiving, Mr. Chekhov. He's busy. Spock, give... Spock to Chekhov, repeat. Give him... I am not receiving... 20 minutes, Spock. 15. I was momentarily <laughs> delayed. Wowza. Everything can be handled from auxiliary control. Uh, the computers contain all the information we need. Damn it. We should all go out and try to swing as many as possible over. You were supposed to tell him to behave, and he didn't. Well, that's, be that's on us. That's on us. We didn't supervise the meetings. <laughs> I'm oh, talking about you. Everybody get in here. It's a party. Long time back when the galaxy was new. Oh, he li he's liking it. He's digging it. Wow, this guy too. If a man tells another man out of my way. Get out of here. He piles up trouble for himself all day. Hell yeah. Can't reach across Spock's gonna join in. Come on. Come on, Spock. If they weren't trying to take over the ship, it'd be kind of cool. <laughs> Oh, that guy! That guy! That guy on the bridge. He's the creepy one who stands behind Kirk and who shot that cube. He got promoted to bridge duty now that Leslie's not around. <laughs> hey, Spock! You brought an instrument, and you're the only one not grooving to the, to the, to the, to the song. You should be joining in with a, a little, a little solo. You know. Ah, uh, is he gonna play? What do you got for us? She's got like a... Some sort of wheel. You don't hear this sound anymore. In music? Oh, it's almost time to break out of... Oh no. Yeah, he's gonna... <laughs> this is so stupid. <laughs> oh, what is that? What is that? That's different. Let's go to auxiliary control. I'm doing my job. Why are we listen why are we listening to it? On the bridge. At least we know where they are and what they're doing. Mm, okay. I don't know why a young mind has to be an undisciplined one. I used to get into a little trouble when I was that age, Scotty, didn't you? Scotty was never that age. 
Uh oh. Hey guy, watch your back. He's gonna do. He's gonna do the thing. Oh. Encore. We haven't taken over the ship quite yet. We already know they're pretty smart, so we'll be able to figure it out pretty quickly. Hey Sulu, what's going on? Captain, I get no response from controls. It's channeled over somewhere. Artillery control. It seems as though someone else is running the ship. Cute. That's right. Mm -hmm. Someone else is running this ship. I am. He's got a great voice, this guy. He's got everything channeled over. Start a trace back on all circuits. See if you can bypass. Do that and I shall retaliate. Bearing into Romulan space. No, no. We know what's in there somewhere. Romulan, Romulans are keeping Eden a secret from us. The Romulans will view this as a military intrusion and attack. Yeah. If you bring her about and return to Starbase, no charges will be leveled. I don't believe that no charges will be... If you do I, not, I don't believe that. You and the ship will be destroyed. He's got jelly in the belly. Real scared. <laughs> 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 that, the musical guy, he's my favorite. He's, he's great. Not only is he good with the music, but everything he says is just gold. He's just a funny guy, you know? The others, the others I can take or leave, but... <laughs> he seems, the other guy, the, the, the musical guy seems like a, a guy you'd want to hang out with, you know? You? Know? Go, go grab some beers, that sort of thing. <laughs> Do you think the guy's Ill, illness will affect something, will... Maybe he'll inf start infecting his friends and they'll all suddenly get really ill and die. He'll realize the error of his ways. I hope not. I hope not. But uh, otherwise we're just gonna like try and bypass auxiliary control. Scotty can get into a, a tube and c cut something or... I don't think reason is gonna get through to him. Adam. You are being led by a man who is insane. Yeah. You are being used by him. <laughs> Clinically insane. Spock said so. Adam, there is a file on Dr. Severin in our computer banks. Ooh. And you're attesting to the fact that he is a carrier, a Sithococcus Nova. <laughs> it's very contagious and deadly. You'll also find a report for giving a full psychological profile on him. He's cuckoo. Brother. And if you see these ears? You know I reach you. Yeah. But there is a tragic difference between what you want and what he wants. He reaches you, though. While they were making friends with Spock, Spock was making friends with him. We've established Eden, Brother Severin. When will we get there? At this speed, three hours. Three hours to Eden. How do you plan to stop them? By cutting off their life support? I have another weapon. I want to see Eden. Whatever happens in this episode, I want to see that planet. Making an adjustment on their circuits. Head Maybe it's a wasteland. Eat all the fruit and throw away the rest. Imagine if it was the Apple Planet. Yeah, that wasn't in Romulan space, though. Brother, yeah. We are within sensor range of Eden. Let's have a look. And continuing to approach. Can we see it? When will you use that? At the proper time. What? What is it? What will that do to them? Be well, I'm using sound against them. Ooh. It will stun them and allow us time to leave. Sound pitch that high doesn't stun. It kills? It destroys. Oh, no. It's correct for you to be concerned, but be assured also. He's insane. Rejoice, brethren. Soon we shall step together into Eden. It's going to destroy your ears, especially Spock's. Oh, Spock hears it. Spock. Do you hear it, Kirk? Oh. We need earplugs. No yeah, we just killed them all. That's okay. You gotta make some sacrifices. You want to go to Eden? You must destroy the, the panel. Did they already beam down? Are you gonna smash it? Or just turn it off? <laughs> you just turned it off. But he had to blow something up. Bridge. Hangar deck. 
I presume they teleported down. Kirk, to bridge. Do you think they're all dead on the planet? Come in. Sulu here, Captain. New theory. They're going to eat all that fruit on that planet and they're all going to die of fruit. A worm is going to get into them. They're all... I think they're all going to be dead on that planet. Why do I think that? Because of uh, Let That Be Your Last Battlefield. Because of that. Because of the way that ended. And I'm sad about it. The alternative is that they're all fine and down there singing and dancing. Living a life. Maybe that guy's illness got to them. I don't know. I just don't see a happy ending for them. I want I want them to have a happy ending. You know? For all the people who've tried to take over the ship. They only did it for a few minutes. I know it was three hours. It was like three minutes. And they were chill. Chill enough. Led by an insane man. <laughs> Do we have control of the ship? No, sir. Control is in auxiliary. So, sir, We're in auxiliary. Sir, one of the shuttlecrafts has been taken. It has landed. Except for those aboard the craft, I read no life at all. Either humanoid nor animal. Any fruit? Spock? I want the coordinates zeroed in so that when we beam down, we won't be visible to them. Got it. Uh, okay. Mr. Chekhov, join us in the transporter room. Why are we doing this this way? There must be a reason. Like cinematographically, to for us to see them, but them not to see us. What are we gonna see? Oh, it's remastered. I don't hear any uh, music. Fantastically beautiful planet. Is this what they believe they find? Don't eat the apples, Doctor Severin. Ah! Oh, the flowers try to kill you, like in the apple. The flowers, sir. I touched it. It's like fire. Why did you touch it? They're so dead, all of them. All this plant life is full of acid. The fruit too. Even the grass, Jim. The grass! They were barefooted! Captain. Uh-oh. No! His hand twitched. Bones? Acid. Fruit is deadly. His name was Adam. Ironic. There's the shuttlecraft. Did anybody survive? Like, once one person starts dying, you don't touch the fruit, right? Then you stay off the grass, then you hide away in the shuttle. Yeah, the seven. Hey, how are your feet? What about Dr. Uh, who is it? Dr. Severin. Bones! He should be beamed aboard, Jim. He needs more than I can do for him here. No, we're not leaving. But we're, we what? can help you aboard the ship. None of us. He is insane. He's sensible, Doctor. No, you're gonna. What are you doing? Back here, you fool! Severin, don't! You'll kill yourself! The acid. Don't bite into that! Stop! Some people you just can't help. A tragic tale. I'm glad they didn't all die. Alert them that we have the four, and we're ready to beam them down. Mark the incident closed. Aye, sir. No charges. Mr. Chekhov? You do? Do you wish to attend? I wish first to apologize for my conduct during this time. Me, no problem. I did not maintain myself under proper discipline. I endangered the ship and its personnel by my conduct. Hey, hey, Chekhov. I know you weren't on the planet in the last episode, but if you'd seen Kirk in that episode, you would not be apologizing right now. <laughs> Kirk deliberately put the, the lives of 400 plus members of the crew, everybody on the crew. He put your lives in danger because he fell in love with a robot. So you spending two minutes kissing your ex-girlfriend and giving her all the secrets of auxiliary control, you know, that's nothing. Don't even, don't even think about it, Chekhov. I respectfully submit myself for disciplinary action. <laughs> you did what you had to do. You may go. It's all good. Thank you, sir. Hey, Scotty, give give Chekhov 20 minutes. There she is. I was coming to say goodbye. And I was coming to say goodbye to you. Be incorrect. Occasionally. And you be correct. 
Occasionally. It is my sincere wish that you do not give up your search for Eden. I have no doubt but that you will find it. Why do we think that one was Eden? Spock thinks it's still out there. We reach Mr. Spock. Whatever, Herbert. He thinks he's cool. He thinks he knows the lingo. You don't know. He doesn't know. Oh, Skip! I know him. I know him. I know Skip. I saw him, like, a couple of weeks ago in an Alfred Hitchcock Presents episode. Hey, first impressions of the Space Hippies episode. It was... I liked it. I, that, that was fine. Maybe my expectations were so low going into it, based on all the stuff I've been reading about Space Hippies in the comments. Yeah, nobody's spoiled anything about the episode, by the way. I've just seen the word a few times. It was fine. It was kind of fun. You know? Nothing horrible. Well, look, look, you can always find something horrible, right? But uh, of all the episodes where somebody's tried to take over the ship, this was... There was some music. There was some... There was some funny moments. There was a pretty lady for Chekhov, you know? We had... Uh, there was a lot of stuff I liked about the episode. And the annoying parts were very were quite few, actually. I thought it was going to be... When they were in the transporter room at the start of the episode, saying Herbert over and over again, that was the worst of it. You know, that was the, oh my god, what is about to happen in this episode. I even suggested to Spock, hey Spock, do you want to take this episode off? Turns out, Spock... Spock is... He's vibing with them. He he's on their level. He understands them. You know? It was Kirk who was the square. You know? To the the big man, the big authority man. Living by the the rules of the system. You know, Spock. Spock understood. He made friends. He jammed with them. He he didn't need to take the episode off because it turns out they weren't that annoying at all for the rest of it. Now, if you didn't like their tunes, if you didn't like the singing, if you didn't like the, the music, there's a lot of it in the episode. If you don't like hippies, there's a lot of them in this episode. But, uh, yeah, initial, initial impressions just coming straight from the episode. Um, it's certainly not, uh, I'm not going to be launching into a 30 minute e essay about it. And this thing, and that thing, and the other thing. It was kind, kind of straightforward in, a, in its own way. It was kind of... It had a kind of a, a wholesome enough vibe to it. And now I'm just going to have a little glimpse online to see, to see if... see what other people thought of the episode. The Wikipedia and all that. The Variety reported that this is the third worst episode of the entire, you know, that sort of thing. I would disagree. If 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 it's on the worst lists, I'm gonna disagree. Yeah, that guy. I know him. I know him from other things. He's a famous famous actor, Charles Napier. I know him. <laughs> In a 2009 interview, Charles Napier recalled auditioning for the part of Adam, which was his first guest starring role. He won the part by jumping onto a table and singing The House of the Rising Sun in front of others trying for the part. That's perfect, because that sums up his, his whole... He brings an energy to this episode, that guy. In particular, more so than even the, the main, the leader, that insane, the insane doctor. Uh, we'll talk about the insanity as well in a little bit, but yeah, he brings the energy. He brings he brings everything to this episode. Without him, it's it's less. The episode is less without him. Without his infectious enthusiasm, without his his kindred friendship with Spock, without the music and the ad. It's not ad lib. Obviously, it's all script written, but his ad lib 
you know, musical rhyming. He just brings it. And he's not that anno annoying either, in, in, from my perspective. So yeah, the fact that he won the part by becoming that character and doing that character and being being that character is maybe it's maybe there's a maybe it's not truthful maybe it's just one of those stories but it feels it feels right you know it feels i like i like the story whether it's true or not the episode has generally been seen as one of the weakest in the show's history well, yeah yeah, I was expecting this. I was expecting it. The space hippie characters are too strange and irritating to view them sympathetically. Yeah, interesting. Oh, yeah, this, this review hates the singing, calling it the worst form of padding. No, there's worse, there's worse padding. We've seen worse padding. There's boring padding. That we've had quite recently you know hey do do another pass and then we just watch another shot of the ship going orbiting the planet or that boringly long 10 minute segment in the lights of zatar when we're all discussing around the table about the woman's brain <laughs> they just it's just there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff that when I'm editing, I'm like, you know, if this is so boring, it's actually easy to edit because I can just, I can just compress it. This scene, I can just compress down and, you know, I don't have to worry so much about the, the copyright stuff. Uh, the the funny thing with the, the singing in this episode, it's going to be annoying for me editing it because I can't include the songs. I can't cut the songs properly because music doesn't like being cut it's very jarring to the ear when you cut music because suddenly you're, you've gone from one part of the song to the another part of the song and unless you do it really really well your brain will be like oh no oh that's oh, uh. so yeah that's that's the that's a, the annoying part for me but as i was saying before i even read this if you didn't like the musical part of the episode, there was a lot of it. This person does, doesn't, so that's why they didn't like the episode. Uh, not, noted a positive aspect that the episode did allow for the voice of dissent against the utopia portrayed by Star Trek. Yeah, I liked... that's something I did like about the episode. Uh, because we've seen... we haven't really seen a proper challenge to how the world of Starfleet and Star Trek is, it's almost almost untouchable. So to have these people who exist within it kind of rejecting it makes you think. It goes, well, you know, what's so bad about this? Like, why are they... Why do they think Chekhov's all been all stuffy and going by the rules? And what's, what's their problem with Chekhov, you know? Why, why would anybody have a problem with the, the system? And then you, you start to think, you go, well, you know, any system is going to have people who don't quite fit into it and don't quite, aren't made to feel welcome by it and things don't gel well with them. Different people have different personalities. And when everybody's stuffed into the same box, you know, the, dra the giraffes are going to have a, a hard time, you know? You know, it's fine for the... <laughs> I don't know where this analogy is going. The giraffes is good, though. You know, everybody knows what I mean by that. <laughs> oh, somebody in 2015 Wired magazine suggested this episode was skippable in their binge watching guide for the Irish. Don't skip any episodes. No way. You gotta skip this one? No, even if you think it's a bad episode, you gotta see it. It's what it. Like, I can understand skipping a boring episode, you know, one that's just dull and plodding. But this is bright, and you gotta see it, even if you think it's crazy and stupid. You have to have it. You have to see it. You know. You know what? I reminded this episode reminds me a little bit. A lot of the beats uh, remind me of the children shall lead. 
you know, you got this this group of people who are annoying and they're going to take control of the ship. And they're following somebody who is insane or in the case of the children will lead uh, a monster and ugly. Don't forget the don't forget that he's ugly. You know, once the <laughs> once the veil drops, once the mask falls off, it's very important that he's ugly. I, I can't believe we followed that episode up with uh, Is There in Truth No Beauty? And we had that conversation about beauty and ugliness. It was just so... It was, oh, it was funny, you know? I was like, what if the episodes were swapped in their run? <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah, that episode is like this ep episode, except uh, this one's better. This one's better. But then again, that's not saying much. Oh yeah, and the next the next person says, "This is the number one best worst episode, noting its unique entertainment value." Exactly, that's exactly what I said. You know, you it's it's one of the ones you gotta watch. You did just to have seen it. You know, I was saying to that guy in the the corridor, "Hey, what are you looking at? This ain't no circus show." Show it, it, it kind of was. It was colorful. It was musical. It was strange. It had. It had some things going on. It was culturally saying something. You know? It had something. Oh, what? The girl, the blonde singer in the episode, co-wrote the music with Charles Napier, Adam, who played Adam. They wrote they wrote that music themselves. That's kind of cool. I like that. That adds a bit of something to the the episode, a bit of authenticity. They weren't just given music to play, or no, they were, I don't think they were playing anything. They weren't just given music to sing. They actually came up with something themselves. It it was very, very 60s. You know, there was a vibe to it, and there were sounds, sounds that you don't hear anymore. On the radio, it's like a whole... I, I, I'm often curious about that, a whole like history of music and certain decades are you just don't hear the sounds in them anymore at least not in popular top hundreds you know i'm sure there are people making 60 sounding music out there in the ether somewhere you just you just don't know where to find them or you don't you're not looking hard enough but uh music doesn't seem to be like fashion or at least the way they speak about fashion, that fashion is cyclical. You know, that the things that your great-grandmother was wearing at school will come around, you know, to to your generation. Music hasn't seemed to be that. You know, we haven't gone back to the 60s. We haven't the 70s, you know. I, I kind of wish we would. I kind of wish we would return to some of that more... just... Yeah, I'm sounding old now, aren't I? <laughs> this is more authentic, you know? Sounding music? What about a soul? What about a heart and soul? Uh, like like Tapau was talking about? Right, next thing on the agenda is to look at... They beam down to this Eden planet. And it looked, they remastered it. And what I'll say about this remaster versus last episode's remaster is that I almost think that this looks, again, fake. And like they've gone too much overboard with it. But in a way, there's something about being on an Eden planet, if it was the real Eden. At the end, it's like, that wasn't really Eden. Let's go find it again sometime. Spock was like, hey, don't give up your your search for it. But um, if you're going to make an Eden, then do go overboard. You know, would be my notes for it. Make it as, as crazily good as you can. Even if it is a bit jarring, <laughs> you know, compared to the, the set we flick back to. You know, because we want, the audience wants to be kind of wowed by it. 
And it was. Like, the, the small little shot we saw of it, I was like, whoa. Maybe, maybe this is Eden. What, the Romulans have been hiding this planet away from us, haven't they? It was like the apple planet. The plants were attacking. They had acid. Acid! The grass, too. Let's have a look at the how it really looked. By the way, it should be noted, full disclosure, I'm in a good mood today. A good mood. That, maybe that, that's an interesting thing to add to your, your brain. Maybe if I was in a bad mood, I'd be ranting about some. <laughs> okay, okay. What is this? That, does that remind me of the Shoreleaf planet, maybe? That shot? The original shot? It maybe reminds me of the Shoreleaf planet. But I think we've seen it. I think I've used it in an episode before. And something's triggering Shoreleaf for me, but... Yeah. Oh, wow. Originally, apparently, suppo supposedly, originally, Chekhov, the, the woman Chekhov's love interest was supposed to be another, yet another Kirk's love interest. But one, she was supposed to be McCoy's daughter. Imagine how different that episode would have been. I would have been questioning why we'd never heard of his daughter before, for, for starters. But after last episode, it inappropriate Kirk don't flirt with McCoy's daughter what are you what are you doing oh, I'm glad that it I'm glad they didn't film that because that's I don't know how they would have done that I want to I want to see it you know in an alternate universe I definitely want to see it but I'm not getting good vibe feelings from from that story you know because Kirk and McCoy are, are generationally equal I know McCoy's a little older but it's not, it's never played that way. It's never played that way. We never refer to McCoy as, as this older figure in the, the group of three, for instance. So to have McCoy's daughter be romantically interested in Kirk is just not. So I understand why they changed that. And look, I, I like giving Chekhov and Sulu and Uhura, who, again, not in the episode, uh, stuff to do. And uh, Chekhov was so... You know you know what's funny about Chekhov in this episode? He was very rigid. That's not the Chekhov that we really know. Remember the Chekhov in Spectre of the Gun? That's the Chekhov we know. The one who's distracted by the pretty lady while everybody else is concerned about the situation. He's off with this imaginary made-up woman. But in this episode, he's so... I am focused on my career. How dare you turn your back on Starfleet? Where were you? You know, I guess he's hurt as well because he has his prior relationship with her. But he's very rigid and by the book and you know, it's part of the story because she's the one who's free and easy and live a little and he's the you know, let's go by the book, let's climb the, that corporate ladder let's do everything we're told you know, he's that character. And in the end they, they learn to to give a little bit towards each other, you know? And anyway, and if, and if somebody asks me in the future, who is Chekhov's woman? That's the one in this one. More than the one in the apple, more than the one in Spectre of the Gun, because she doesn't exist. More than the two in I'm Mud. More than... More than a feeling... When I hear that old song they used to play. Speaking of the 70s. Uh, uh, well, I was listening to Chekhov's love interest, yeah. But uh, yeah, she's the one. The one in this one. The way she looked at him. The way he melted under her gaze. He couldn't bear to look at her because he knew once he looked at her, he'd never be able to resist her. Yeah, she's the one. Sulu! Sulu joined their cause immediately, didn't he? Ah, Sulu. I miss Sulu. Sulu was very prominent in season one. Then he had that time off, and once he came back to the show, they didn't give him much to do afterward, afterwards. But yeah, 
I kept joking in season one about Sulu being one with the body, because he was he's he's so easily turned in every situation, and yeah, in this one he was two seconds away from being turned. Their plan, by the way, to make friends with all the crew and to you know, you know I'll get Spark, I'll get Chekhov, we'll get this guy and that guy, and we'll get Sulu, and we'll get all the people into, we'll make friends with everybody. A little reminiscent of Let That Be Your Last Battlefield, you know, the sneaky guy in the. In the room with a gap, the room with a view of a gap. Um, that plan was irrelevant, really. Two things were important: one, getting close to Chekhov and getting Chekhov to tell us all about auxiliary control. M- most important. Two, play the music all through the ship so that the security guard outside Doctor Doctor Guy's. Uh, would be just dancing and just completely distracted so we could we could get him that's the only two things we needed to do we didn't need to get Sulu we didn't need to get anybody else on the ship we didn't need to go to engineering to recruit some of Scotty's people you know that was just irrelevant irrelevant now speaking of what let's find out his name I want to say Dr. Severn Uh, yeah, Dr. Severn. The insane one. Uh, not very evident. Very, very clear at the end. When he reaches what he thinks is Eden, or what he... Maybe he doesn't believe it's Eden anymore. But he's so frustrated and so... He's like, his whole mission to get here took so much out of him that he's like, it's here or bust. It's here or bust. I believe, I if I will it enough, I'm going to believe it, I'm going to take a bite from this apple. That's where he's insane. That's where he's clearly insane. The rest of it, I, I liked his performance, I liked his frustration, I liked... You know, sure, the, the ear thing, that's another sign that he's insane. I don't think insane is the word to use with that. I think uh, he's... He, he's wants to get there at any cost. This that's different to being insane. You know, in in that instance. So I think he's just a frustrated man who who's willing to do go beyond what he should to get what he wants and to hell with the consequences and you know to hell with his supposed friends like I, I, I'm I unclear, I'm not very clear on why we were so certain that he was insane. Apart from the fact that clearly he was, because Spock said it, and because it turned out that he was in the end. You know, the rest of them weren't going to jump onto that tree and take an apple, because they're like, oh, acid, acid grass. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, go, I'm, I'll go back. We're done here, you know? So, yeah. Maybe it's easier to call him insane. Maybe it's easier for the story to have him be as insane, so that we don't take his side too much. Maybe it's important to see him as this villain, rather than somebody who just wanted to find this place so much. Like I was saying earlier in the episode, if it wasn't for them stealing the ship and taking over the Enterprise... Uh, would they still be treating them like they treat them in the episode? And the answer is yes. It, it becomes clear that the answer is yes when Chekhov is talking to his ex-girlfriend. He's so disapproving of the choices she made to throw away her life for something that he sees as silly. Uh, but, uh, yeah... I don't know. And in the end, it sort of was, it, it was kind of a fool's quest because it, they didn't get there. But then Spock kind of balances that, it out a bit by saying that, you know, he's very, Spock is very respectful in this episode towards them. And I do appreciate that because nobody else is. And Spock, again, a rock in episodes where you might think things are going crazy. 
Like in the last episode, he was he was the same rank in the last episode, keeping Kirk, at least, at least warning Kirk, not to do silly things. <laughs> There's a part in um, Willy Wonka in the Chocolate Factory. <laughs> Why am I bringing this up? Where Gene Wilder is like, oh no, don't, don't come back, or it's something. He's he's saying the words. He knows this kid is going to do something stupid and get themselves turned into a, I don't know, a pumpkin or, you know, whatever those kids get up to in that movie. He's saying the words, he sees what's coming, but he doesn't, he's not really. <laughs> That's what Spock felt like in the last episode, when he's trying to rein in Kirk a bit. He's like, let's just, let's just, look, let's just focus on the, focus on the cure, shall we? He knows that Kirk's not going to listen to him. <laughs> but he's saying the words anyway. What else will I reference? We had Boston. We had Willy Wonka. People hate this episode. I've read a few more things. Everybody hates it. The stupidest, stupid... Hate. Oh, I hate this. It's the, the silliest episode ever. There's a, there's a venom... To, to people hating this episode, which I find interesting. I find it interesting because because of so many episodes I would write underneath it. So many episodes that we've seen that I would put below this one. Uh, but hey, look. Preferences. You know, people's... People... The thing is, it's so easy to hate this episode. It's so easy to point to this episode, bring your friends in from another room and go, hey, look at these look at these stupid people. This is the worst thing ever. Look, look at them dancing around and jumping around like they're, they're stupid. It's so easy for this, for people to hate this episode and for to, to rank it really lowly. But uh, I think I think there's something there's something there's something to it. There's something to it. A little bit of pushback against Starfleet about the utopia of Starfleet. There's a little bit of judgment from from all the characters except for Spock. Spock is great, and uh, Adam is great. You know. But yeah, did you expect? Did you, did you were you coming into this video thinking I was gonna hate this episode? Probably, maybe, maybe. You know, maybe you loved last episode and you didn't expect me to go all crazy on that one. Maybe you were like, "Requiem for Methuselah is a, is a really good episode. How can you like the Space Hippies one and hate the the Methuselah one? Did you watch the Methuselah one? Did you listen? Did, were your ears open?" Did you see characters that were acting out of character, bizarrely, stupidly? At least these space hippies were true to themselves. They knew what they were doing. You know, they were they were kind of goofballs, but they weren't out of character. <laughs> I don't know that that ear piercing thing, by the way, that the insane doctor came up with. That. Uh, was going to incapacitate them, but wouldn't hurt them permanently. And everybody's saying, oh, but it will. But it will. That destroys it. That's not just going to... It's going to destroy. They were... Everybody was just fine. There was no... The doctor was right about the sonic weapon that they used to get off the ship and incapacitate the crew. Now, maybe if they'd stayed under for another few minutes, they would have all lost their hearing. But as it played out... If they hadn't had that line of dialogue, if they weren't debating whether or not it was going to be, you know, really destructive, then it would have been perfectly, you know, a bit annoying and a bit painful, but, you know, kind of benign in the end. No evidence for him being a cutthroat, evil person by using that. There were a few people, a few of the hippies didn't have much to do. The one with the, the crazy hair like me and 
one of the girls who looked like a kind of looked like a blonde cheerleader. I guess she was she was singing, wasn't she? So she did have something to do. But I think there was another another girl who didn't have much to do. Uh, of the six. Hey, it's usually five. Usually five people try to take over. Remember, it was five Calvins. Five Wink of the Eye people. Was it five Wink of the Eye people or six? I can check that. Maybe it was six. I'm going to have to undo my whole five thing if I'm wrong about this. No, it was five. Five Wink, wink of the Eye people. Five Calvins. But six hippies. They needed that extra one. You know, they'd seen the previous episodes. They're like, well, we can't do it with... We can't do it with just five. Five children will eat. There were five in the children who will eat. Who will eat. Five is the magic number for this... For taking over the ship. Right. Anything else you want to talk about? I'm hearing voices. Hearing voices. I think I said I wouldn't talk for 30 minutes about this episode, and then I did. There's always there's always stuff to talk about. You know? That's what makes this show so great. The good episodes, the bad episodes. That guy had funny ears. He was he was the kind of there's something aquatic about the ears, I think. When I'm looking at them. Like they're there's something I'm getting an aquatic feel for them. When I look at them. I was kind of unclear about his illness as well. He had a he had something. He was a carrier for something, but uh, everybody was everybody was vaccinated, so don't don't have to worry about it. We had to wait twenty four hours to see if any of the crew had it, but we never talked about it again. And I think the concern was when they beamed down with him that they would because they couldn't get vaccinated anymore within like a year or, a, or after a certain amount of time had passed, he would pass it on to them and they would die. So he was condemning them to die and not telling them about that because he was so committed to getting there. He said some stuff about, I don't know, I, I don't know exactly. It's unclear why he wanted to go there specifically or how the whole movement started. Did he want to go there, but did he think that he would be cured once he got there? Was he so annoyed by... Did he blame this rigid technological society for getting it in the first place? And he just wanted some place to be away from that, to not think about it. You know? Was that it? And my final question is, why did they think? Why did, were they so sure? And why was Spock and Chekhov, because they were doing the research too, that Eden, the planet we went to, was Eden? And then once we got there and realized the grass was acid, does Spock think that there is still an Eden out there? Well, how were we supposed to find it? We were sure it was this planet. How, why were we sure? And how can we be sure again about another planet? What evidence are we using to? Historical records, you know? The Bible? The Bible doesn't <laughs> describe a planet in space in Romulan territory. You know, I don't... I think that we can just hand wave it away as don't don't ask about it, don't think about it, because there is no answer. You can write write your own answer to that. Oh, and we got to see Childcraft again, the seven, the only one we've got. They've taken a Childcraft. Which one? The only one, the one we use all the time. The next episode is called The Cloud Minders. Great. Great. We need some we we need some of those, you know? Just in case. They wander off. They're like shepherds, you know? We need shepherds for sheep. And we need cloud minders for clouds. Because they're the same basic shape and color. See? Figured it out. Figured it out. Oh, this episode, not really something you have to figure out. Very That's what I mean meant earlier when I said it was very straightforward. 
they were very clear about what they wanted to do. We need, we want to go to Eden. Take us to Eden. Oh, you're not taking us. We'll take it ourselves. And that was it. There was nothing. You know, maybe you question Doctor Severin's mind. Maybe you question Chekhov's girlfriend's intentions and motivations. Uh, it did seem like she was pumping him for information, but it was very clear that she still had feelings for him. And that was proven at the end as well. So, yeah. All in all, I had a fun time today. But I am in a good mood. You know, I am in a good mood. <laughs> one of them, one of them, the one, the one with the, the hair uh was an ambassador's son or something so we had to be that's why we didn't lock them in the bridge brig that's the only reason we will let them wander around the ship just to have the episode happen i'm not sure we needed to do that you know and we weren't going to press charges for them stealing and destroying that that vessel we were going to we were taking the guy in let that be your last battlefield back to Starbase to face charges, weren't we? Because he stole a shuttlecraft? Just a few episodes ago. Double standards. It's one standard for monochromes. It's another standard for... You know? The half-whites? Half-blacks? Half whatever. Which one they were? No. That's, that's Starfleet for you. Right, have a great week until the cloud miners. I'll be back, you'll be back. And uh, I'll leave, leave with a song in your heart, hopefully. And a new appreciation for an episode that everybody hates. And uh, it ain't so bad, you know? And if you think otherwise, well, you know what that makes you. You know what that makes you. You're a freaking Herbert. Rick and Herbert. See you next week.